roll call. Commissioner Fowler. Commissioner Scribner. Commissioner Sanders. Here. Commissioner Bauer. Here. Commissioner McGibbon. Here. Commissioner Morris. Here. Commissioner McGuire. Here. Commissioner Couch. Commissioner Rivera. At this time, um, Commissioner McGuire is going to lead us in the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're on to now number three, approval of the minutes of the December 4th, 2019 meeting. Second. I have a uh, first and a second. Uh, all in favor say, uh, all in favor uh, vote please. Motion approved, all ayes. Uh, number four, public comments. Yeah. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons desiring to address the commission on any matter not on this agenda and over which commissions have jurisdiction. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record before making your presentation. We're on to number five, notice of public hearings. We have uh, three dealing with the same uh, district, so we're going to combine 1760 North of the River Sanitation District number one, 1754 North of the River Sanitary District number one, 1753 North of the River Sanitary District number one, and County Service Area 71, Mr. Knox. Uh, the North of the River Sanitation District has requested an annexation. An annexation outside the current sphere of boundaries requires a sphere of influence amendment. A sphere of influence amendment cannot be updated without a current municipal service review. A municipal service review can't complete without a CEQA document. And so it goes. So today the commission is hearing a, a municipal service review, a sphere of influence amendment, and, a, and an annexation proceeding along with a detachment. As I commonly do, I'll make, a pres make one presentation and then the commission will handle the three items as three separate votes. The MSR before you includes information on the services provided by North River Sanitation Sanitary District. In adopting an MSR, the commission is requiring to make determinations in six different areas. Growth and population, the location and characteristics of any disadvantaged unincorporated communities within or contiguous to the sphere of influence. That would be Oildale in this case. Infrastructure needs and deficiencies, which is included in the report. Financial constraints and opportunities. Opportunities for shared facilities, which they do with the city of Shafter, uh, city of Bakersfield, and CSA 71. Uh, evaluation of management efficiencies is the last. The district has provided updated information and narrative on each of the uh, areas for review. The commission is required to adopt determinations for each of the areas of review. The determinations recommended for adoption by the commission could be found starting on in section 2-1. The sphere of influence for North River Santi San Sanitary District number one has a sphere of influence that is not coterminous with the district boundaries. This sphere change brought uh, today to the commission is in conjunction with the request to annex eight parcels scattered both within and outside their current sphere of influence. Uh, Mr. Rice has a map that he's gonna put up on the screen here 
that shows the eight different parcels. Hoping we can get that up. There we go. I'll let Mr. Rice explain what the eight parcels are. Okay, uh, basically as you can see what I did was I did an exhibit map that kind of combines both the sphere, uh, the annexation, and then also the detachments from CSA 71. So it's a little busy, I apologize for that, but when you're looking at five different areas and eight parcels, it's kind of hard to get it all in one. Uh, the crosshatch area, the dark uh, crosshatch go that's going from the, uh, I guess from the right to the left, that's going to be your sphere of influence right there. So in the, it includes three uh, of the, the first three areas. So one, two, three parcels. And then you're looking at the annexations, which is going to be coming up on the next one, and that's going to be the dark areas. And then the detachments are the crosshatch going in opposite directions. That's going to be the detachments from CSA 71. The sphere of influence meets the CEQA requirements through a negative declaration adopted by the district. For the annexation, uh, the proposed annexation of approximately 377.6 acres consisting of eight scattered parcels of both developed and unimproved land into North River Sanitation, Sanitary District and a detachment from CSA 71 from the affected areas. Parcels D, E, F, and a portion of parcel C1 are currently receiving sewer service from the district. The district has signed an indemnification agreement. There are no tax increases involved. The eight parcels have a variety of zone re zoning requirements. This annexation will not cause any zone changes. It's consistent with the general plan, regional transportation plan, or specific plan. Uh, there is no ag land conversion. It conforms to the assessor's parcels. There, are no, there is no functional overlap. Uh, the project does not increase water usage. CEQA is uh, handled by notice of exemption adopted by the applicant. As noted, the district is already providing sewer service to several parcels in, in this annexation. We are pleased to work with management of the district to clean up these parcels and bring the district into compliance with state law. Effective and overlapping agencies and districts were notified. No comments were provided. The process required by the Cortese Knox Hertzberg Act has been followed, including notices to affected agencies and any notices and publications required by law. Annexation to the district has 100% landowner consent. The district has requested that notice, hearing, and protest hearing be waived. With that, I have three recommendations. And we'll start with the, with the municipal service review. I believe we should take a vote at that point, then do the sphere of influence, take a vote, and then uh, annexation, and then the vote. So my recommendation for the Municipal Service Review is to adopt by resolution the updated MSR, include all the de determinations, and consider the negative declaration adopted by North Lee River Sanitary District. Is there any um, public comment? Uh, not commissioners, do you have any co comments or questions? Uh, I need a motion. Uh, Make a motion, we approve. Second. <laughs> Please cast your votes. Yes, again. Oh, 
Okay. Motion approved, all ayes. Mr. Chairman, my recommendation for the sphere of influence is to adopt by resolution the sphere of influence as presented, including the notice of exemption adopted by a district and conditions recommended by the executive officer. Is there any public comment? If not, commissioners, do you have any comment or questions? Please cast your votes. Well, we won't. Or we need a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. Okay, please cast your votes. Motion approved, all ayes. Mr. Chairman, my recommendation on the annexation and detachment is recommended that the commission adopt by resolution the proposed annexation. Uh, consider the environmental document adopted by the applicant. We have notice hearing and protest hearing and approve annexation number 1753 with detachment from CSA 71, conditions set by the executive officer. Any public comment? If not, commissioners, any questions or uh, comments? If not, do I have a motion? Make that motion. To I have a first and a second. Please cast your votes. Motion approved, all ayes. We're on to number six, pub public project review. There is none. Correct. Uh, moving on to number seven, commission items. Uh, uh, 7A, appointment of chair and vice chair. Um, Mr. Knox. The first meeting of every year, this commission appoints a chair and vice chair. While the commission does not have a written policy, tradition has been to rotate between the different types of commissioners. For instance, it goes from county to public to special district to city and then back to county. While this is a, while this is a tradition, all city commissioners are eligible to put their name into nomination. The current vice chair, Commissioner Morris, has requested she not be considered for the chair at this time. If the commissioner, commission would like to elect another commissioner from a city, the choice would be, be between California City and the city of Bakersfield. California City will be stepping off the commission in May and will not be able to serve a full year. I have discussed with Commissioner Rivera for the City of Bakersfield and he's willing to serve as chair as needed. Again, if the commission desires to keep the tradition of the rotation, the county would be in line to serve as vice chair. As neither of our county commissioners are here, um, we could either nominate one now if that's the direction you want to go, or we could wait till the next meeting. It doesn't have to happen without their um, participation. Participate, participation. I did not reach out to either one of them. Uh, I was expecting Commissioner Scrivener not to be here, but I didn't have any indication from Commissioner Couch that he would not. So um, you could, you could put their name in it, one of their names in the nomination or you can ta table that portion for the next meeting if you like. If, that, if that's the direction you wanna go. If one of you wants to put your name in the nomination to be vice chair, we can do that too. So it's, it's an open process here. Commissioners, any comments on this? Uh, I think uh, uh, Commissioner R uh, Rivera should, be, should get the chair and uh, Commissioner Scrivener be uh, vice chair. That's, that would be my motion. Okay. okay, do we have a second to that motion? Second. Okay. Is there any public comment to this issue? Commissioners, any, any further comments or questions? If not, uh, we have the motion. Uh, please cast your votes.
Motion approved. All ayes. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, as this will be your last meeting as the chair, we, the commission wanted to thank you for your year of service. Uh, you've done an excellent job as our chairman. Even, even sometimes you said you weren't. <laughs> um, you have been an excellent chairman. Uh, you have asked not to receive a plaque, but we've had each of the commissioners here sign, it, sign a card for you, wow. thanking you for okay. your service. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we're on to uh, uh, number eight, general business. Um, A, approval of claims list number 20-01. Uh, commissioners, do you have any uh, comments or questions? Um, if not, uh, I need a, uh, a motion. Make a motion to approve uh, the claim. Second. Please cast your votes. <clears throat> Motion approved. All ayes. Okay. We're now on to uh, B. Um, Record retention and display po and disposal policy, Mr. Knox. Yes, this commission has a wealth of information that is vital to the operation and history of cities and special districts in Kern County. Our office also contains files and boxes of records that are of no value to anyone. I have insurance documents going back to the 70s, Form 700s from the 80s, and credit card receipts from the 1990s. It's time to clean house of records that are no longer needed. This commission does not have a current policy on record retention and disposal. In your agenda packet is a policy document put together by council that follows state recommendations. It's very straightforward and allows for a clear understanding of what records need to be destroyed and what needs to be kept and for how long. It is my recommendation to approve policy as presented. Is there any public comment to this issue? If not, commissioners, do you have any comment or questions? If not, do I have a motion? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Second. Okay. Motion by uh, Commissioner Morris and a second by Mc 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 Commissioner uh, McGuire. Uh, please cast your votes. Motion approved, all ayes. We're on to uh, C, um, Cal LAFCO dues structure modification update. Mr. Knox. Yes. At the last commission meeting, I brought a proposal to present Cal LAFCO an alternative offer to the revised dues structure recently adopted by the Cal LAFCO board after a vote of the membership. That proposal was sent to Cal LAFCO board and was considered at their December meeting. Through your board uh, rejected our offer on the grounds that they did not have authority to accept. The CalAFCO bylaws only allow for the reduction of dues uh, due to financial hardship, which I did not claim. I claim that the dues are unequally distributed throughout the membership and are therefore unfair. On the surface, this may look like a setback. It is not. The goal was not to get a one-off deal for Kern LAFCO, but rather to force the conversation towards reconsideration of the due structure as a whole. Including your agenda is a letter from Cal Lafco with two offers. One is for the regional chair to come to our next commission meeting and answer your questions that you may have. The other is to address the Cal Lafco board at their next meeting, uh, February 21st in San Diego. An explanation of how the structure of dues was reached would be helpful to, in understanding the mindset that created the current structure but in reading through their materials, it has come, become very clear that they do not have a persuasive argument to adequately, adequately address our concerns to the point of changing the uh, uh, opinion of this commission. I know it won't change my opinion that the fee structure is un, unfairly spread across the 58 LAFCOs. As you, as you might remember, we are 9% of the population of, 
of Los Angeles County, yet we're going to be paying the same dues amount. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for anybody. Although I enjoy, always enjoy a trip to San, Di San Diego, my intention is to call into the next Calafco uh, board meeting. I don't want to spend more money on this than that we're actually going to try to save. Uh, so I'm going to call in. I want you to know that Cal Kern, Kern Lafco is now not alone. Other Lafcos are pushing back as well. I will see what reaction I get and the reaction to others. From there, I will coordinate with other Lafcos and see if we can get some kind of movement. And dues do not go into effect until June, so we got a little time to work on this. And this is just an informational item. There's no, no motion or anything for you guys to no vote for required on this item. Okay, we're number, uh, we're on to um, 8D, uh, Kern Groundwater Sustainability Act presentation. Mr. Knox. Yes. When this commission considered a proceeding, there are a number of factors that are carefully researched. For this commission to approve additional area or additional services without using the best data available would not be serving our communities to the best of our ability. With the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, new information will be available for the first time that will provide a more accurate picture of a city or district's ability or restrictions in providing usable water. As with any new law, how that information is used and interpreted is not yet well known. With that in mind, I have asked Patty Piori with the Kern Groundwater Authority to be here today to walk us through SIGMA what it means to Kern County cities and special districts, both from an urban and agricultural perspective. KGA will be submitting to the state a groundwater sustainab sustainability plan, or GSP, covering the valley floor portion of Kern County. This GSP is due at the end of this month, so this is very timely. Mrs. Piori, thank you for being here this evening. I see that you brought Eric Everett and, and Jason Giaquinto with you. Uh, from Semi-Tropic and Rosedale Rio Bravo. Uh, we will bring up your presentation in PowerPoint. Uh, are you comfortable taking questions as we go or would sure. you like to finish your presentation? Yep. As we go. As we go would be great. Looks perfect. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity. Hi, Liz. Um, um, so I just, uh, just so you know, we go back to the phone company like, 30 years ago, but don't tell anybody. Um, so thank you so much for um, the opportunity uh, for uh, bringing you up to speed on a very complex law. And what makes it even more complex law is that in this basin, water is very complex. This basin is probably, well, it is. And you, the state and the uh, Department of Water Resources will tell you, Kern County, when it comes to water, it is the most complex uh, d basin in the state of California when it comes to water because of the uh, diversification of water supplies, how we handle water here, and uh, how we move water here. And they, this, this county is very fortunate in that we've got some very knowledgeable water districts like the two that I brought with me today. Um, who have years of expertise on doing just that, moving water, buying water, getting water here, selling water, transferring water, exchanging water, you name it, they can do it. Um, and that has really allowed this basin to um, be more progressive in when it comes to that type of water uh, processing and banking, uh, storing water, um, and so, Sigma is kind of uh, a little bit more complicated for this basin than in everywhere else in the state of California. We also happen to be the largest basin in the state of California. So when you add those two together, it's, it's kind of complicated. So we're going to try to make it a simple thing for you, but don't hesitate to ask questions as we go along. Um, so the very first uh, slide, if you could switch that over, is kind of giving you where this basin is. If you can see, the Kern Basin is extremely large. It is the largest basin, again, in the state of California when you talk about um, SIGMA, the Groundwater Sustainability Act. Um, and so the laws were passed 
um, in 2014, became affected in 2015. And what had happened, it classified the Kern County Basin as what we call a uh, critically overdrafted basin. And by that definition, it uh, uh, put us in a timeline schedule that we have to have submitted to the Department of Water Resources by the end of this month, January 31st, 2020, a what we call a groundwater sustainability plan. And in that plan, it has to be able to advise the state how we are gonna become sustainable in this basin in 20 years. And we do have that plan we do have the capability to show we can become sustainable. However, it's going to take a lot of work in the communities, a lot of work by the farmers, a lot of work by all of us in order to get that sustainability done. And so this has set us on a course of the next 20 years to work together um, as this, in this basin, because if we don't, we won't be successful. And through this next process, we always have the state water board right here saying, if you don't do something, we're gonna take your basin over, which none of us would like that to happen. So we wanna make sure that we get as much people informed on how this process will move forward, but we also wanna give this board an opportunity to understand how we got here. What caused us to get to this position, this whole situation, because it wasn't caused by lack of purchasing water. That's the, you'll see as we move forward. This basin has done um, and set itself up to be successful in the early 40s and 50s by contracting for the state water project and the federal water project. And in all honesty, um, the lack of our deliveries has put us in this position, not the lack of purchase of waters. So I just kind of want to set that tone real fast. The next slide is a, a slide telling you that in Kern County, which we all know, agriculture is the leading uh, employer, as well as the, most, uh, the, the largest industry in this county and has been for decades. And so we have an industry that has progressively improved its water usage over the years. They're very efficient. They've become more efficient as even before Sigma became into existence. And so the agricultural industry has literally worked with, made work with less water and been able to keep the crops going because our deliveries have not happened. So we have been ranked um, in Kern County as the number one producing county in the United States, not just in the state, but in the United States for three consecutive years. And we will probably take away Fresno. They think they were last year, but they mispriced onions. And so we don't agree with that. Uh, but uh, we would have uh, taken that position four times, four, four consecutive years had Fresno not thrown an onion pricing uh, fix into the equation. Um, but the thing that's most important is that to know that at, out of Kern County, one out of five jobs are directly related to agriculture. That is an amazing number. 64% of the employment is done by ag in this county. And so that is a, a staggering number. So ag is very important to this uh, community and has been for years. Do you wanna go? We're gonna switch up for you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Patty, for giving me the lead in. Um, so first off, Patty talked a lot about agriculture, and I think it's important to understand the history. So agriculture in this valley, um, or in this basin, was um, primarily dependent upon groundwater with the exception of the Kern River up until about the 70s. And so if you look at where our water comes from on a surface water standpoint, um, we have a good chunk, about 700,000 comes from the Kern River. Uh, about 430,000 comes from the Central Valley Project, which is the federal project off the uh, Bryant Current Canal. And almost a million acre feet comes from the State Water Project, with the remainder, uh, about 36%, um, being uh, from the groundwater basin itself. Go ahead, next slide. 
a little more, a little flash there. There we go. <laughs> so the surface water, um, it's, it's a complex thing to manage, and there's a number of water districts um, whose, that's their primary responsibility is to manage surface water. Uh, so this is a nice little graphical depiction of where those water districts lie. Um, uh, the green districts are primarily sourced from the or served Kern River water. The light pink and darker pink are federal projects or federal districts, so they receive water from the Friant Kern Canal. And then the uh, light blue are those that receive state water from the California Aqueduct. Um, and so this is how basically through the, these districts how surface water is managed here in the county. The next slide. So given that California has a very lumpy water supply, and that's a technical term, um, we have wet years and dry years. We've made significant investments since the late 80s in groundwater banking. Um, and this just identifies where those groundwater banking programs are. These allow us to um, basically bank water in wet years to be able to move that water into a dry year when we need it. Um, so with these investments that we've made in the past, we're in a pretty good place to actually be able to handle uh, SIGMA, or Sustainable Groundwater Management Act compliance. Next slide. This couple neat slots of uh, groundwater banking. So this is actually a, a shot I took last year of the Kern Water Bank. Actually, it's a couple, three projects are here in this picture you have in the center. is The lower center is actually the city of Bakersfield. On the left and right of the Kern River, on the lower part is actually the Pioneer Project. And as you move to up, up the picture, you have the Kern Water Bank. Um, so that's just one slot and uh, shot showing the, our, some of our water banks in operation. Next slide. So in addition to water banking um, like we do on the Kern Water Bank, we also have some creeks that do flow periodically. Uh, this is a snapshot of uh, the Pozo Creek which uh, provides a surface water supply periodically. And there has been recharge projects set up along Pozo Creek um, to kind of augment uh, what we can do with the water from the Fryant Project or the uh, State Water Project. Next slide. So the question is, why are we having to do, deal with Sigma to begin with? Um, so the first issue is that, well, early on, uh, folks in Kern County recognized that farming with the reliance upon groundwater was not sustainable. And so we did, we subscribed to the state water project and we subscribed to the federal water project to be able to wean ourselves off of groundwater to bring a supplemental supply in. So the amount of demand from an agricultural perspective has not really changed for a number of years. Uh, what has changed is that we've seen a reduction in the amount of import water we receive from the state project due to environmental restrictions and then also the same on the federal project due to the San Joaquin River restoration. So if your demand is the same and your surface water supplies are reduced, what happens? Well, landowners are forced to go back to the groundwater basin. Um, and so that's the choice that we made. So of course, with reduced surface water imports, um, we've now seen a reduction of groundwater levels here in Kern County. And that is the key reason why we're dealing with Sigma. Next slide. So I'll give a little more of a zoom in. This is actually the allocations of the State Water Project, just for uh, reference. Um, Kern County has a contract for roughly a million acre feet of state water. That means we're entitled to receive up to a million acre feet, depending upon hydrology. Prior to 2000, um, the, those, that state water contract was 90% reliable, so we received about 900,000 acre feet per year on average, uh, from an average annual basis. Then in 2000, we started seeing the, really the impacts of the Endangered Species Act and other regulations in the Delta that started restricting Delta exports. So if you look at the period from 2000 to current, the state water project's no longer 90% reliable, it's about 60% reliable. And so for Kern County, we basically lost about 300,000 acre feet of, of average annual water supply due to the loss of exports out of the Delta. I want you to remember 300,000 acre feet because it'll be very pertinent here in a little bit. Next slide. So kind of going to the challenges, all of our surface water supplies have been challenged coming into Kern County. Uh, the Kern River, we've had uh, reduced uh, storage in Lake Isabella due to the dam modification project, so we haven't had full uh, ability to maximize use of Isabella. Hopefully that'll change here in the near future. The state water project, we've had issues of declining reliability because of exports due to salmon or smelt or water quality issues in the Delta. And with that declining yield of surface water supplies, those landowners in the basin here in Kern County have had to go back to the well uh, to maintain the productivity. On the demand side, we've had challenges as well. Um, we've had change of cropping patterns. So 
uh, prior, you know, now we're probably more in permanent crops. I know for my district, we're 70% permanent crops, that's trees and vines. And of course, we're also dealing with an increasing population from an urban perspective, so our demand is hardening. Next slide. So from points to remember before I pass this off is that Kern County, we did subscribe to surface water programs because we knew that groundwater reliance was not sustainable. We could not uh, support the amount of economic development we have here in the county with groundwater alone. So we did fix the problem. However, due to the changing of the rules, the regulations, those contracts or those programs are not as reliable as they once were. Um, we have addressed uh, a lot of the supply reliability issues from hydrology perspective uh, by investments in groundwater banking. Um, refer to back to the previous slide. And so currently we have the ability on an annual basis to recharge about 1.7 million acre feet. That's almost two times our state water contract in a very wet year. So we can take advantage of flood conditions. And then from a recovery perspective, I think if you look at the combined uh, recovery from the banking projects, it's roughly a million acre feet per year. Um, but goes back to the same problem. Um, we're not willing to uh, sacrifice our economic development, our landowners, agricultural economy has been forced to go back to the groundwater basin to maintain the economic productivity of their crops. So whenever you hear about the state water allocation um, for Kern County, every 10% reduction in our state water allocation from a long-term average annual basis is equivalent to 25,000 acres being driven to be 100% reliant upon the groundwater basin. So we really need to figure out a way to import, increase our supplies and thus we have Sigma. So where are you taking over after this one, after yeah. this slide? Okay, so Eric's gonna pick up after this and uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I'll, I'll ask. Sure. So are, is water quality the same coming from state and federal project uh, that we have with groundwater? And how does that affect? Um, water quality is different on the three supplies. Um, Kern River and Fryant is really pristine water. Um, state water, uh, water off the state water project, not as good. We do have some salt loading that comes in. It's still very good water. Um, and does it, is it better or worse than our groundwater? It depends where you are in the basin. And that's because the groundwater quality is not the same everywhere in, in Kern County. Okay. So, good evening. Um, in the interest of time, I have to be up at Bakersfield College at six o'clock, and so I'm gonna defer to my, with my slides. If, if, Bud, would you mind putting the next one more? And so, um, J Jason touched on this number, 300,000, and to, to make what we're trying to present um, easier to grasp, I use an analogy that I think most people will relate to, and that's a, a budget. Most of us have a budget for our home. We have revenues and we have expenses. And in the world of water, revenues is the amount of water that we can bring in from the state water project, from the Friant project, things that Jason described, but also it's how much we pump from the groundwater basin. And then the expenses are how much water we use, predominantly in irrigated agriculture. And we are running a deficit. So I want you to think of the budget, so every month, we're, uh, or every year, we're writing checks for 300,000 acre feet that we don't have. And so that's where that number becomes very meaningful because this Sigma, this new legislation says, you can't do that anymore. You have 20 years to wean yourself off, but the consequence of what's been happening is most of us would get an overdraft fee from our bank. Well, we get an overdraft fee in the basin in the form of lowered water levels. And so Sigma says, we have to manage this basin just like you would manage your checking account. You have to prevent overdraft fees and you have to manage revenues and expenses. And so as Jason touched on, it's very important that we preserve our water supplies. Um, that is foundational. Now I pulled this map up because I think it's, it's relevant to what you do as a LAFCO commission and that is you evaluate annexations and spheres of influence. And part of that process, I, if I understand correctly, is that you evaluate whether or not they can provide services. And so I'll, give, I'll use my district as an example. Um, within my district, we have a groundwater sustainability plan, and that describes how we're going to achieve sustainability. But more importantly, from your process, it identifies how much water is actually available for development. And uh, that's very, very important. So if somebody wants to build uh, a shopping center or a home development within my district, we, can, we, we have the ability to say there's adequate water supply for that development. 
Um, however, there are many regions, and some of them are shown on the map, um, uh, where there's not a color. We call those white areas. They don't have a water supply or they don't have a, a management area over them. Um, and they frankly don't have the ability to be developed. And so to the extent that there's an annexation or a sphere of influence that calls upon those areas and uh, proposes development, um, you need to be aware of that, that there's actually either very little or no water uh, available for the, for the development of that area. And so um, our goal as water district managers is to uh, comply with this new requirement that we balance our budget um, and that we develop supplies as much as we can to offset that $300,000 overdraft fee that we've been carrying for the last few years. And it's gonna, be, it's gonna come in the form of both supply augmentation, but an unfortunate consequence of the other side of that is demand reduction. And so Jason touched on 10% of the, re, uh, every, every reduction of 10% in our state project allocation translates to 25,000 acres of ground going to the groundwater basin. Well, in the world of Sigma, we can't do that anymore. In fact, um, really what happens is that translates probably into 25,000 acres of very productive and economically viable ground coming out of production or urban areas that can't be developed. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna yield the floor and the time because I think Patty's very last slide will touch on probably one of the more important messages is what does that translate to the county of Kern in the form of economic viability, both as a tax base, but you know just our overall um, economic footprint within the basin. So I appreciate your time and I apologize for having to bow out late, but I, okay. I got to hit the road, so thank you. Okay, um, let's go to the next slide. So as both Jason and Eric and I have advised you is that we purchased plenty of water back in the, back when the State Water Project was in existence, when it first started. And that statement that you see there is from the Department of Water Resources that stated back in 1980 that if Kern County was to receive 100% of its entitlements, this basin would not be classified as critically overdrafted. We would not have an overdraft. Now, the other thing you kind of have to remember about this, when we don't get our deliveries, the bill still has to be paid. So even though we don't receive our water, we still have to pay the bill. So that's the other part of the equation that's a little bit more uh, wrenching to deal with, is that the farmer is still paying for that water bill. Next uh, slide. Remember we talked about the 300,000 um, acre feet? Real important. We've done a water model for the entire basin, which is required um, under the new program, under new Sigma law. And that law and that modeling told us we are currently, today, baseline, we are 324,326 acre feet in deficit. So we know that we would, be, we would be flush, sustainable, and we would get our deliveries because our model says that's exactly what we're short in water. Next slide. Those are the next items you see there, what they call the undesirable results. We cannot have any of those happen in the next 20 years. If we have any of those triggered, we would have the state to answer to, the state water board. The ones in blue are the ones that we deal with here in Kern County because the other two do not exist in Kern County. We do not have to worry about the depletions of interconnected surface water, and we don't have to worry about seawater intrusion. But the other four, we do have to maintain um, under Sigma for the next 20 years that the, none of those occur. Right now in the GSP, our groundwater sustainability plan, none of those should occur. We have forecasted that those should not occur uh, based on water management projects that we have going to move forward with. The next slide. What you see here is the actual um, graph that shows you if we do our projects, you can see the sustainability because that would be the yellow um, bar. The darker bar is if we don't do them. So, that is our intent is to do the projects and just roughly those projects are going to run about 50 to 70 million dollars so they're not going to be uh, cheap 
and nine times out of 10, those are gonna be paid by the agricultural industry. Next slide. So what you see here is, again, the model results. And we are required in those model results to take into consideration climate change. Um, this state, you know, is very ho-hum on climate change. Everything has to be considered when it comes to climate change. This law is no different. So we had to do a climate change uh, validation on the model, which you see the results there. But even with climate change taken into consideration, if those water management projects do come into existence, we can still maintain the sustainability in this basin. Next slide. What you see here is the economic impact to this basin. As both Jason and Eric explained in their parts there, that we have a supply and a demand. And we all know that the supply, as long as we are not receiving our deliveries because the water is in the delta going to the ocean, so as long as that continues, we won't receive our supplies. So we have our demands. We need to have them sustainable. It's like Eric said, it's a checkbook. So how do we do that? If we don't have management projects, we will have to fallow land, take it out of production, and right now we're forecasting about 190,000 acres of Kern County going out of production. And so that is going to impact um, property tax values, county revenues, city revenues, school tax revenues, special district revenues, municipality revenues. And so knowing what this board does when it talks about uh, municipal service reviews for expansion of their cities, municipal uh, spheres of influences, or consideration of annexations. What Sigma is selling, telling us is we have to be very careful on those decisions that we make going forward. We need to make sure that there is enough water for those projects, that forecasted uh, sphere of influence, because right now the only municipality that has any surface water is the city of Bakersfield. All of the other municipalities are reliant on groundwater only. So when they say they're going to expand their city, they're actually using groundwater, which is not allowed under Sigma. You have to balance the groundwater. So when the agricultural districts don't receive their water supplies, if there's a municipality within that district, there's not enough water to go around. And so the water and the Sigma law does not allow any of us to take away a water right. So when you have a farmer who has purchased water and he has a water right, he has priority over that water right. So we have to be very careful as we move forward that we're not promising more than we can give. And it comes down to who and how are we going to work with the demands that we have and the lack of supplies we're receiving. And thusly, we have 20 years to balance it and make it sustainable. So it is a, not a good way to end this presentation. Is that a very good note? But it is a reality note. It is that we have to make sure that as we move forward, we're working collaboratively um, to comply with Sigma. Because again, the only thing that, if we don't do it that way, we will not be successful. And again, we have the state right behind us that will step in and then they'll tell us what we will do. Because that's the way the law is written. They would then come in and tell us what we would do. So that's unfortunate, but that is the way the law was written. So we know that we can be successful if we're all working collaboratively, we're communicating with each other, we're listening to each other, we're talking to districts, we're talking to groundwater sustainability agencies, because that is how we can be you know, successful. It, I don't think we can if we don't do that. That's it. Thank you. I, I got just a couple. How much water 
do the cities on the coast use? I wouldn't know how much they use. Because it, it appears to me if they were to do, if the state would require them to do desalinization plants, like they do in Dubai and places like that, that would take the strain off the water usage. Only yeah. in those basins, we, that we don't have access to those, the, the, we don't have access to their water. Um, San Luis Obispo is a critically overdrafted basin. Santa Barbara is a critically overdrafted basin as well. So I know those two counties are going through the same process that we're doing here right now. Um, I do believe desal is one of their projects um, that they would like to be able to do within the next 20 years. But the first desal uh, project was just put in, I think, in LA. It took them 25, 30 years to get it up and running. We only have 20 years. Okay. Thank you. Penny, is there a place in the plan that talks about urban growth and how to account for that? We did look at urban growth. It is a requirement. Um, our model took it into account. We did do that. It doesn't guarantee the water, though. Okay. Okay. There's no guarantee that... Um, Unless it's, a, unless it's a water source owned by a municipality, which is what the city of Bakersfield has. Mm -hmm. They own a right to the Kern River. All the other municipalities do not have a surface water supply. They're strictly groundwater. So they're not guaranteed a water supply. The model does not guarantee a water supply. It takes into account population growth as a demand but not as a supply. Okay. What percentage of the Kern River does the um, Bay City of Bakersfield own? I don't know exactly. They are one of the largest owners of the river. Um, they share that right. So they with, own the majority of it? Or? They uh, share that right with Buena Vista um, and Kern Delta and the City of Bakersfield and North Kern. So they own that right with those uh, entities but I don't know the percentage exactly. I think it fluctuates too by how much water is right. available. Yeah, yeah. And how about the uh, tunnels under the uh, delta? Will, is that something that will uh, help in the future if it ever happens? If it ever happens. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's another project that's been on the books for how many years? Um, you know, it's unfortunate um, that the um, Endangered Species Act is being used to held, you know, literally hold up water, um, and uh, it's it's put a lot of strain on just not even current, not just Kern County, but in the LA basin as well. Um, but it, uh, if those, if that project was ever to come into existence, absolutely, absolutely. But we're not holding our breath either. Yeah. So the state water projects, the tunnel project is not considered in your GSP? It is in some of my districts that have state water project, but it's not a priority. They're not okay. making it like that's going to be their savior at all. Matter of fact, they've put it in there just to have it in there, but not as a, they're not, again, they're not holding their breath on that coming into existence. Right. So Patty, in the past, you've worked on residential and commercial development. If you were doing that today, how would you find a water source for that so that it could be approved? I would definitely be talking to um, a groundwater sustainability agency. I would be talking to the district and where the land is located at. I'd be looking at the historical water use from the property that it was where I'm purchasing and building. Um, I would make sure that I have a very strong will serve letter from um, the district um, who's controlling the water in that area. Yeah. Matter of fact, I've told many uh, developers that I know that they should be looking at will serve letters in a different light. Usually, the will serve letters weren't really, uh, they were handed out like candy. Uh, now, now with the uh, Sigma, that's not the way it should be handled going forward. Right, and as LAFCO, in the past, we've used will serve letters to determine whether a development could 
get support, be supported with enough water supply. We don't know if those are going to be good going forward, so we may need to be getting those from the GSP itself. From the GSA? GSA itself. Yeah. Um, to determine whether the water supply is, is adequate enough to, to continue to develop. Yeah. For some of these cities. I worked for Lennar for 10 years, so I'm real familiar with purchasing land and flipping it and building it and all of that part of it. That's what uh, Blair's referring to. Mm. Um, uh, and so um, that was good back then, but this law changes everything. It's not business as usual. It, unfortunately, it is not. It is, it is a game changer. It is what it is. We have to look at how do we become sustainable. We don't want to go to the state. We don't want any of those undesirable results to be triggered. So we have to be you know, good stewards. That's really what it comes out to be. We have to be good stewards, and we have to start communicating and talking to each other and figuring out how best to move forward. But ultimately, that's the only way we'll be successful. How will these plans be challenged? Do you suspect? They're planning documents. So they're not CEQA documents. So I think we have a little bit of a cushion there. If they had been CEQA documents, they'd be in court for 20, 50 years. I could see that happening. Um, but they're planning documents. So it's hard to appeal a planning document. Mm -hmm. um, it just courts don't usually will allow, a, you know, because a planning document is, a, is adaptive, which this is. And so, like we have every five years, we have to we have to uh, we have to update the plan. It's required by the law. So every five years, we have to update this plan. Um, we have to report annually. It's a requirement, um, also as well. So we have to be able to tell the state exactly each year how much are we using in water, what is our demand, and what are we doing to close that gap. Every year we have to do that. And every year they have the ability to come back and say, why are you not doing enough? So we have to be cognizant that we, again, have to be good stewards of, of this. We have to find that sweet spot is where we're going. So I, I've had cities tell me, well, if we develop it, it'll actually use less water than ag agriculture. So it's a benefit. Well, whose water are they using, though? Right, that's part of the question. And as you've informed me, uh, not all development uses the same amount of water. So it depends, it also depends on what crop you're growing. Some crops use more, some less. So that may not necessarily be true. Correct. Um, and that's why a good place to start is to make sure that they have really provided this board adequate information with information from either the directly from the GSA or directly from a water district where they plan to build. So, because a water right cannot be taken away from a landowner, but he also doesn't have to sell it either. So he can sell a piece of property and keep his water right. So you have to be aware of that. So again, I think going forward, as you're looking at annexations, you're looking at spheres of influence, I strongly would recommend that there be some communication with either the GSA or the district themselves. Commissioner uh, Stewart here has yeah. a question. Yes, I have a, a <clears throat> question. In your presentation, I pick up that most of your study includes ag land. What about residential areas and where savings could be assumed or even when they're developed get more use out of the existing water by changing, for instance, our... Uh... Landscaping. Got it. Yeah, we took all that into account in the model. We took Senate Bill 1668 and Senate Bill 616, which is the conservation requirements for urban, where they have to reduce their per capita by 2025. That was taken into account along with the uh, census for population growth. So we did take all that into account. We took into account the requirements for new landscaping as well. You have all of those already modeled into the model. Now, what, to, what Blair was referring to 
is um, depending upon the size of the lots, depends upon how much uh, per acre uh, you'll use. For example, if you're building small lots, let's say you're building uh, 10 lots to an acre, they're gonna use probably about as much water inside the house as you do carrots. That's not necessarily true. Hmm. Because carrots don't use that much water. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to look at, that's why it's real important to get with the districts because they know what's been grown on pieces of property. They know the water usage for that piece of property. So if somebody's gonna come in and put a residential, um, they can see is, is, there, is, it, is it equal, is it a savings, what is it? So all of that has to be considered going forward, absolutely. But if you're looking at you know, somebody building um, five homes per acre, as long as they're not putting in landscaping wall to wall, there's a possibility that would work. It all depends upon what is being considered for the development. To your point though, for urban, there is a lot of things urban can do. They can do purple pipe, which is using outside the house the waste treated wastewater for the outside of their landscaping, which is being done north of Seven Standard Road at the Lennar project. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with that one because I designed it. <laughs> so that one does have purple pipe opportunity in there. It also has got the new guidelines for landscaping. So there are ways to kind of balance that. But then again, the only way we know if it's going to really work going forward is, again, communicating, right, getting the right information to the decision makers so that the decision makers know they're making a, a, a really good decision that won't impact anybody else down the road. Hmm. Any further questions? If not, I recently read a book that was uh, published uh, recently called The Dreamt Land uh, by Mark Ericks. And I found it very interesting, and it dealt with Kern County quite extensively. I don't know if you're familiar I'm with I'm not. Book. Are you familiar with that one? He is. <laughs> <laughs> what is your comment on the book, uh, good or bad? I think it's a good story. Yeah. I think there was some licenses taken. Um, that some of the stuff was correct. Some of it was, you know, it's a good story. <laughs> um, but there are some good factual components about it. I think the biggest thing that we're getting to today is under Sigma is that we've now had to define what the water supplies are. And we are no longer in a position where the water basin is unlimited. And so, you know, going back to kind of decisions on land use planning, we now have a tool we're quantifying how much water is here and we have a state mandate to live within our means. And so um, that's one of the good things out of Sigma where you know, to the days of just wanting to break open new land and if I can sink a well and I've got water underneath it and I can pump for un, you know, unrestricted quantities as long as it's for beneficial use, we're good. Well, that changed. And so that's what we're having to deal with here in Kern okay. County. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Okay, we're on to um, AD, uh, Executive Officer Miscellaneous Items. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, think, uh, just a couple of quick items. Um, we are doing a little bit of staff training. Aaron recently went to a CalPERS training to help with uh, how to handle payroll and, and retirement reporting with them. Uh, CalPERS is always complicated, and so appreci appreciate her doing that. Uh, quickly in the future, uh, Mr. Rice will be um, going to a GIS conference in, in Long Beach, uh, retaining some more information and contacts at, at that event. Uh, soon you'll be seeing a uh, application for the formation of a new district. This is in Weldon. Up, in, up near Lake Isabella. Uh, you've seen a little bit of this before. We brought to you the petition signatures. Uh, that was about a year ago. It takes a while to get this, uh, an application like this uh, going, uh, but we've now got all the information back from the county and we'll be sending it out to um, 
affected districts and then on to uh, the citizens of, of Weldon and that area. So you're gonna have that coming before your commission soon. So that's, that's new for us, doing an actual uh, new district. I haven't done that in a long time. Uh, what we have been doing is dissolving districts. Uh, last year we dissolved 18 CSAs in one special district. And uh, I've been looking to dissolve a, a resource conservation district, Kern Valley Resource Conservation District. Uh, if you remember, we did the last round of dissolutions with a new law that allows a streamlined process. It requires a state controller's office to put on a list what districts are inactive and eligible for being dis dissolved. Even though Kern Valley RCD has not been really active for well over 20 years, they did not put it on the inactive district list because of $47 of interest that was earned in a county account two years ago. It has nothing to do with, what, with whether they've actually done any work or been active at all. Uh, it's because you have to show no financial activity and they're taking a hard line stance that that $47 is financial activity. So I'm not gonna be able to dissolve that district right away. Um, so I'm gonna keep working on it. They've promised me it's gonna be on next year's list, but then I gotta turn around and find funding for it. Right now I know I have funding, but it may not be here next year. Uh, when we dissolved Rosedale Rio Bravo Resource Conservation District, the Department of Conservation helped fund that dissolution of that district and annex into Northwest Kern Resource Conservation District. Uh, it cost about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to to do that project, and I don't have money in the budget just to handle another one of those right now. So I got to find money elsewhere. So I'm, I'm continuing to work on that. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, California City will be stepping off here in April. Uh, we also will have an election for special district member, that's Chairman McKibben's seat uh, coming up. So we'll be working with the current Special Districts Association to uh, receive nominations and hold an election for, for that seat. Um, so that's coming up. Also, when, uh, for several of you, you received or will be getting a packet uh, for, for Form 700s that you need to fill out, depending on what category you are. Um, if you're with the city, you're gonna have to fill it out for your city and your city clerk can just send it over to us. Um, but for public members and special districts, you'll, you'll be sending those to us directly, so. With that, our next meeting is February 21st. 21st, and that's the close of my comments. Thank you for being here. Okay, we're now adjourned.